Hey everyone, my name is Ben Grist and welcome back to another video. Today, we're thinking about the question, which Bible translation should I use and why? If you go to a Christian bookshop or go online or even on Amazon or something, it can be pretty overwhelming to decide what Bible you want. Not just what color you want and uh, the style, but actually uh, all of these acronyms and what does it actually mean, all these translations? But it wasn't always like that. If you go back 50 or 100 years, what you'd find is that there are barely any English translations at all. Today, we're gonna to think about some of the common questions concerning biblical translation. For example, what Bible translation is most accurate? Which translation is easiest to read? And what should I be looking out for when buying a Bible? And much more, so stick around for that. To start with, we're just gonna cover a very brief history of the original languages of the Bible. As you know, the Bible wasn't originally written in English. The Old Testament was primarily written in Hebrew with different parts in Aramaic. And then the New Testament was written primarily in ancient Greek, which was the official language of the Roman Empire at the time. We do come into some problems, for example, how each of the original Bible languages have different cultural contexts that we have to deal with, but also, the main fact is that we don't actually have any of the original manuscripts. What we can do is look at the thousands and thousands of copies of these manuscripts that date back even up to about 100 years after the originals were written. Over the centuries, various different people had tried to collate all of these manuscript copies to try and recreate what the original might have been like. And one of the first was a Greek printed text of the New Testament called the Textus Receptus, or the Received Text. And in fact, this is what some of our older English Bible translations were based off, like the King James Version of the Bible. As more and more manuscript copies were examined and collated, a new version was created in 1881 called the Westcott and Hort Greek New Testament, preferring what is known as the Alexandrian text type. This came to be known as the Critical Text, because it contained essential critical apparatus and footnotes of various different manuscripts and their comparisons. Even though many of these ancient manuscripts are fairly readily available for anyone to read and translate, this critical text ended up becoming the standard for many modern translations because it was fairly well put together. Nowadays, pretty much all English translations of the New Testament rely on this critical text, apart from a few like the King James Version, which still rely on the received text. And now on to English translations. An age-old problem when it comes to translating any piece of literature from one language into another, both languages always have some sort of difference in grammar, cultural idioms, and usually words that aren't always directly synonymous. It's so tempting to translate word for word completely accurately, but what we find is that usually it doesn't make any sense in the new language. One great example of this is translating something like the Spanish phrase, como se llama, into English. We come across two fairly different translations. The first being, what is itself called? And the second being, what is your name? What we see is that the first translation was the literal translation. We translated each word for its corresponding word in English, but it didn't really make sense. But then the second one, which supposedly is less accurate, would be unanimously correct no matter who you speak to. When translating Bibles, we are left with two types of translation methods. The first is known of as formal equivalence or word for word translations. And this is where the priority is put onto what the original language said and how it was said. The translation aims to try and translate the original word into the new word as well as possible and trying to translate even the same order as much as possible, even if it doesn't make sense. Some popular Bible translations like this are called the New American Standard Bible and the Revised Standard Version. The other type of translation method is known of as dynamic equivalence or thought for thought translations. And these aim to give priority onto what the text actually means and to make it as readable as possible. In comparison to just translating the text, these translators aim to also translate the ideas and create a balance of the two. Some popular Bible translations like this are the New Living Translation, the Good News Bible, and the Message Version. As scary as this may seem, it's not usually this extreme. In fact, the large variety of Bibles are usually found somewhere around the middle of the spectrum between being very literal on one side and being very meaningful on the other. So now on to picking the right translation for you. And I'm gonna share some details of some recommended translations as well. First on our list is the King James Version or the KJV. This was first published in 1611 and it's mainly a formal equivalence or literal translation. 
it stays fairly close to the original sentence structure, but it changes where the meaning is compromised. And the average reading age suggested for this is 17 plus. A verse that we're gonna to use to compare is, but whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother it have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? From 1 John 3.17. King James, the first of England, he launched this translation for English-speaking Protestants in 1604. Approximately 50 of the best Bible scholars and linguists of his day spent seven years on the translation, which was a revision of the Bishop's Bible of 1568. It has a majestic style and it used precise translation rather than paraphrasing. However, its language can feel antiquated and less approachable to some readers today. Next up is the Message Translation, or the MSG. This was published recently by a guy called Eugene Peterson in 2002, and it's more of a dynamic equivalence. In fact, this is more paraphrased than anything else. It's still a translation, but it is often very colloquial and renders the original language loosely. And I would say anyone above the age of nine could read this. Or sample verse, if you see some brother or sister in need and have the means to do something about it, but turn a cold shoulder and do nothing, what happens to God's love? It disappears and you made it disappear. Third up on our list is the English Standard Version or the ESV. This was published in 2001. It's also a formal equivalence. It's fairly literal, staying close to the original sentence structure, but changing it where meaning is compromised. And I'd say the average reading age for this is about 15 plus. Our sample verse, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? The English Standard Version was first published in 2001 and is considered an essentially literal translation. 100 scholars produced it based on faithfulness to the historic Orthodox text. It's extensively footnoted to elaborate on why the text choices were made and they meet every five years to discuss revisions. Number four is the New Living Translation. The New Living Translation, or the NLT, was first published in 1996 when I was born. It's a dynamic equivalence type of translation and the average reading age I would say is about 11 plus. And our sample verse, if someone has enough money to live well and sees a brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? The Tyndale House Publishers launched the New Living Translation in 1996, a revision of the Living Bible. Like many other translations, it took seven years to produce. The goal was to communicate the meaning of the ancient text as accurately as possible to the modern reader. 90 biblical scholars labored to make the text fresher and more readable, conveying whole thoughts in everyday language rather than translating word by word. Number five is the New American Standard Bible or the NASB. It was first published in 1971 and then updated in 1995. It was maybe more of a formal equivalence type of translation, definitely on near the end of the spectrum. The average reading age is about 16 plus. Our sample verse, but whoever has the world's good and sees his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? This translation is another literal word for word translation that was dedicated to being true to the original sources grammatically correct and understandable. It uses modern idioms where they are needed to convey the meaning clearly. And then finally, probably one of the most popular translations is the New International Version, or the NIV. It was first published in 1982. It's more of a formal equivalence type of translation, though I'd probably say it's probably slap bang in the middle. The average reading age is probably about 12 plus. Our sample verse, but whoever has the world's good and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? The translation of the NIV began in 1965 with a multi-denominational international group of scholars gathered in Palos Heights, Illinois. The goal was to create an accurate, clear and dignified translation that could be used in a variety of circumstances, from the liturgy to teaching and private reading. The aim for thought for thought translation from the original text, emphasizing the contextual meaning rather than the literal translation of each word. It was published in 1973. A committee meets yearly to consider changes. So before we finish, I just wanna answer a couple of common questions. The first one being, can I just use one translation? Well, we've established that no translation can be perfect, but there are some that are more useful for a variety of situations than others. For example, if you're new to the Bible, why not start with a translation that involves a lot of technical language? And so look for a translation that's focused more on being thought for thought. 
if you're looking to study the Bible text closely and even look at individual words, then maybe looking for a more literal word for word translation would be good for you. Or even if you knew ancient Greek or Hebrew, why not find an interlinear Bible that has the original languages in it? If you're wanting a Bible to read as a devotion or for longer reading at a time, then again, thought for thought translation might be more readable. If you're doing a group Bible study, that sometimes it's more useful to agree on a translation or similar translation to all use, usually about halfway across on the spectrum between formal and dynamic equivalence is good. Another question, are all translations safe? And I would say definitely not. There are certain translations out there that have actually been created by cults and non-Christian groups. And so usually these are the type of translations that have uh, words missing or passages missing, or they've changed certain bits to fit with their agenda and their ideologies. A great way to find out whether a translation has been um, made by a cult is to look at who published it and why it was published. And so this will sometimes help with that. Once you find the translation that's right for you, then it's the fun bit because now you get to decide what type of Bible you want. And there isn't just one type. There are loads of different types of Bibles, everything from wide margin Bibles, journaling Bibles, Bibles with pictures in it, uh, audio Bibles, parallel Bibles, study Bibles. There is such a wealth of resources out there, guys. So why don't you use it? But that's everything we've got time for today. Check out some of the other videos I've got concerning some of these other topics as well. But that's everything from today, and I hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.